Well, you don't need to vote like that. Just outvote people. But the problem with that is redistricting is the way you can hurt even if people vote. Because what you do with redistricting, you stack, pack, and bleach the voters all into one area. So even if you vote at maximum strength, when it comes to district races, your, your power is limited to those districts. Right? So we have to even challenge some who claim to be our friends to say, well, it's just, just turn out the vote. It's not just turning out the vote. That's why I think the people who wrote the uh, 15th Amendment back in the 1870s had the wisdom to say, not only must you be against those who deny the right to vote, but those who abridge the right to vote. In other words, whenever bridges are removed, whenever opportunities are removed, they give us opportunity to vote, that's a violation too. But you think about it, 10 years through multiple, it didn't start with Trump, 10 years through multiple administrations, We've not had an all-out fight to restore the voting rights act. You know, there's some repentance in there for even all of us in civil rights organizations. White and black. Because voting rights affects every other thing. If you suppress the vote, you suppress people getting elected who will pass living wages and health care and environmental protections. Ten years. Ten years. 15, that's right. So this is sacred ground. So it's really, for the last 10 years when we've been coming down here, we've been coming here, but people have been going the other way across, back across the bridge. Which is why I don't really think we should be calling this commemoration as much as we should call it recommitment. All right. And reconsecration. Not just commemoration, because commemoration would suggest we're commemorating what was done and what was done is still in place. The fact of the matter is we have less voting rights sitting in here tonight than we had August 6, 1965. All right, all right. That's the reality. I was in, in a talk with a friend from Europe, and she said to me, I don't understand. I said, what? She said, didn't you all vote for voting rights in 1965? Yeah. She said, well, what do you mean they took it away? Well, what, 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 how do you do that? And then when we look at the issue of wages, we've not raised the living wage, the minimum wage, in 13 years. In 13 years. Actually 14, since 2009. And I think being in the real sense, we have to couple these things and stop talking about them as voting rights is a black issue and wages is just a labor issue, but they need to be connected. Why? Because at the end of the march from Selma to Montgomery, people forget there was a, that Dr. King took the time to make it make sense. I wish we read that speech more. I think it's actually his greatest speech. I think I had a dream of his greatest closing, but I think the march is on the steps of the Alabama State House was his greatest analysis, right? Because what he does is he walks through the first reconstruction in his speech between 1868 and 1890. And he helps us understand at that time, he was trying to help us understand they were in the middle of the second reconstruction. And then Mark, he says a line, you and I talk about it all the time, he says, you need to understand this voting in a larger context than just for black folk. <clears throat> in fact, Dr. King never in any of his speeches talked about the main pur purpose of voting was to elect personalities. He said, give us the ballot and we will pass such and such a thing. It was always about policy, right? It was about representation, but it was about electing representation that were truly represent. But then he says at that sermon, and this is about 30 minutes before Viola Wusa, a white woman, was shot and killed, transporting black people back. Let's not forget James Reed, killed Jimmy Lee Jackson. Blood beaten, blood killed, blood shot. He said, he said these words. He said, the greatest fear of the Southern aristocracy, as the folk that control the money, is for the masses of Negroes and poor white people to form 
a political voting bloc that would fundamentally shift the economic architecture of America. All right. All right. That was his dream. This is 65, before 65. That was what he saw. What he saw. That was the commitment. And he knew, but he was saying, that's always been the fear. He said it was the fear going all the way back to Reconstruction. It was the fear then. It's the fear now. Do you know even now, one third of all poor people live in the South? There's not a state in the South that has under 40% of its people who are poor and low wealth. There's not a state in the South where under 40% of its people make less than a living wage. In the South, in the South, there's not a state from North, from Maryland to Arizona that if you got 25% of poor and low wealth voters who have not voted to join together and vote in a block, they could decide every governor's race every Senate race, every presidential race. The South is not real, it's unorganized. No. Because there's been so much to do to divide us. The whole Southern strategy was to divide white and black, to make sure that that coalition never came together. Maybe sometimes these events, tornadoes and others, can drive us together. Can drive us together. Can drive us together. They better because, listen, you talk about Alabama, let me tell you, 45% of the people of Alabama are poor or at or low income. Two million residents. 53% of the children. Notice at first I'm not even going to do the racial breakdown, I'm just going to break down the reality. 47% of all the women, 1.1 million. 60% of all people of color, 976,000. 37% of white people, 1.1 million. And oftentimes, you will hear people who come in the room who are uninformed, and they say, well, the reason is white people are voting against their own best interest. Most poor white folk didn't vote for Trump. Most poor low wealth white folk did not, don't, do not vote for extremists. I'm talking about what the data says, not what people say. They just don't vote. Because when you go and ask poor low wealth people from Appalachia to Alabama, I've been in their homes, I've been in places, they say they don't vote because nobody talks about poverty. Nobody talks about the poor. Nobody talks about the intersection between race and poverty. That the same people who are blocking voting rights are also blocking living wages. So they just tune out. There's this whole sleeping giant that's out there. Martin saw it. Others saw it. Quickly, Mark, if you look in this, in, this, in this state right now, if you look in this state of, of Alabama, 420,000 people are uninsured. 36% of the census tracts in Alabama are at risk of being unable to afford water, afford basic water. Over 103,000 veterans have incomes less than $35,000 a year. 29,800 tons of nitrile oxygen are emitted in Alabama. It's the leading cause of respiratory problems. The leading cause of respiratory problems. Almost 3,800 3, people are homeless every day in Alabama. In Alabama, you have to work 82 hours a week at the federal minimum wage. Come on to afford possibly a two-bedroom apartment and eat meat twice a week. That's right. 948,000 workers, 948,000 workers make under $15 an hour. 51% of Alabama's workforce. So we're going to organize. Come on. We got to organize this sleeping giant. Right now. We got to find language that can bring this group of people. You say, well, everybody's not going to come. Well, the Bible tells me you don't always need everybody if you can get a room. <laughs> Amos chapter 5 says, God says, I get a remnant. A remnant. And what we have to do is, is find, I was in Kentucky then, up in eastern uh, Kentucky, and some folks said, you better not go up there, they're going to kill you. I said, I know those folk up there. I said, that's, that's the, the, the Hat Hartfield, Hatfield, McCord, but that's also Ann Brady. It was one of the great white civil rights. I said, that's also my daddy's. Country. My grandfather was a coal miner in West Virginia, Kentucky. He fought with white and black coal miners in the 1920s. You don't hear people talking about that. They battled the, 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 the bosses. So we went up to eastern Kentucky on a Tuesday. 
about three or four hundred people showed up, mostly white, and we brought some people in from Louisville. And we put a map up and we showed all of the elected officials in the State House of Kentucky. And then we showed where they voted on voting rights, where they voted on LGBTQI gay issues, where they voted on living wages, and where they voted on saving the pensions of coal miners. The guy in the name of Coy in the back room, he said, Reverend, do that again. I said, all right. He said, well, I will be damned if they ain't been playing us against each other. He said, ain't nobody showed us that the same people up here telling us that they're trying to preserve the vote, protect voting for all the same folk allowing these companies to take our pensions. I said, yes, you are. Come on. Now, what you going to do about it? That's it. Now, what you, what you need to know is Folk got together in five counties. Those five counties prior to had gone quote unquote red. They organized three of them, went different in the next election, and they put out an incumbent uh, extremist, called some Republican extremist, in Kentucky in an off year election. They changed the outcome of the election by bringing white folk from eastern Kentucky and black folk from Louisville together. Look, helping folks to understand that when economic and social tornadoes hit us, they, that, that hits all of us. That's right. It hits all of us. And so we must remember that. We've got to find a way to say in this moment, and we said to some politicians that want to come here, if you're not, if, if we have to have an all-out push on these three things, voting rights, not only the, the restoration of voting rights, that, but the John Lewis for the people there. And not the watered down one that Manchin got them to water down on and then wouldn't even vote for his own compromise.